Hi, everyone. Thanks, and we're excited to welcome you to today's conversation on a year of firsts. We've got an intimate group, so happy to keep this, you know, casual and conversational. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat, and we'll happily pause periodically to answer them. To first introduce myself, my name is Laura. I lead strategic partnerships here at Border, and today I'm excited to introduce you all to our amazing panel of speakers. Over the next 30 or so minutes, we're going to be discussing the influx of new shoppers, new e-commerce trends, and with all of that, new customer expectations. And who better to guide you all through that conversation than our experts from Border, from Adobe, and from Proficient. And with that, Andrea, I'll pass it to you to, to kick us off with some introductions. So hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Montero. I'm Director of Product here at Forder. Um, and I look after our uh, core functionality of software uh, as a service for fraud, um, as well as our channel strategy. So very nice to meet everyone. Looking forward to this uh, discussion. And with that, I will pass it to Tori. Hi everybody, Tori Brunker. I'm Senior Director for Product Marketing at Adobe, specifically focused on our Adobe Commerce product um, and suite of services. Uh, very excited to be here um, and talk to all of you about uh, what is happening in the world of commerce. Hey everyone, Justin Ursine, Director of Commerce Strategy here at Proficient. Um, been with Proficient about two years, uh, primarily focused on working with our clients um, to align different pieces of technology similar to Forder and Adobe um, with the experiences that their customers desire, um, as well as making it easy for employees as well too. So uh, thanks to Forder for having me on here and looking forward to our discussion today. Great, thanks guys. And before we dive in to help guide the conversation, we've got a quick poll for the audience. It will just be popping up in a minute. So we're curious to hear from you. What are your big bets for 2022? Is it personalization, engaging customer experience, new trends, customer loyalty programs? Yeah, I see. It looks like we're neck and neck between engaging customer experiences and personalization, really no surprise there. I think that's also a perfect segue into our first topic, new customers. And, and obviously, uh, you know, new, you know, customer expectations and experiences with, with those new shoppers. So Justin, I'm curious to hear from you. We all know with COVID, there's been dramatic changes in buying habits in terms of products and categories and experiences that we're all now seeking. How, how are you and the proficient team thinking about these, these new customer habits? Yeah, it's a great point, right? And um, thanks to COVID, or I'll, I'll say due to COVID, we don't want to thank COVID for anything, right? Um, but because of COVID, uh, we all were stuck at home. And because we were stuck at home, we had to buy things like groceries and, and different things like shampoo and soap and toothpaste that we'd normally go to stores for from home. And we had to leverage delivery services to actually receive those products either because stores were closed or it wasn't safe to go out. And because of that, it created a lot of new habitual things that we as consumers um, started to to do, you know, buying new experiences or experiencing new things um, because of COVID. And because of that, that shifted the habits that we have as consumers. And that's really sticking both on the B2C side as well as the B2B side. So from the proficient side, what we're really looking to align on are, you know, if we're working with a client, we're saying, how has their customers uh, changed over the last two years? What looks different about them? What's important to them? And how do we build out different features or experiences through commerce that allow people to buy in these new habits that they've kind of curated over the last few years. And with that, you know, it looks a lot different than it did. And these consumer expectations are going to continuously change as well too. And I think we'll probably dive into some of the specifics later. So I'll leave that as sort of a, a footnote or a cliffhanger for the folks that are on, but there's some really interesting ways that I think brands can um, explore options to increase customer adoption and lifetime value by enhancing experiences based upon these new habits that were learned during COVID. So it's a very exciting exciting time. It's a very fast paced moving time. Um, but there's a lot of ways that that folks can take this on um, in, in, a, in a matter that isn't as uh, um, scary as you might think. So I think uh, what we're really focused on is just making sure we're um, understanding who our customer's customer is, and then aligning the different pieces of technology back to the experiences that they desire due to what they've kind of uh, seen during COVID. 
Yeah, Justin, I'd love to build on that. I think one of the things we've seen from an Adobe perspective is that expectation of a more personalized experience. And um, that was validated through a recent McKinsey study where they cited that 71% of consumers actually expect um, at least some level of a personalized experience when they're shopping online. And I think a lot of that has to do with that becoming a more prominent method during the post COVID era. And, you know, one of those big trends um, as well is buy online, pick up in store. Our uh, digital holiday report showed that 40% of all orders on December 23rd, um, which was a peak day, uh, actually were buy online, pick up in store. And we actually have now predicted that for 2022, one in four orders will leverage uh, buy online, pick up in store. And that certainly presents new challenges from an experience perspective for merchants and buyers alike. Um, you know, that expectation of, you know, ongoing sort of instant gratification, not only in availability, but delivery methodologies as well. Sorry, I think that's really interesting. And um, to build up on what you're saying, I think what we're seeing to your point to this idea of both the desire of an expectation of personalization, as well as the um, desire for uh, types of fulfillment and different shopping experiences that meet customer needs. Um, what we've seen on, on the um, protection and fraud side, on the trust side of the house is that um, this actually provides a greater surface area for fraud and abuse. And it's not only about um, what is it that you can lose in terms of fraud, potential fraud with some of these new experiences, as well as um, some of these delivery methods, but it's also the lost customer opportunity. And I think um, uh, you can see some statistics, I think, on the screen where what we've seen in our research is that for every dollar lost to fraud, enterprises lose $30 uh, due to false decline of genuine customers. So this concept of having a new customer coming into your store where it's new to the internet uh, because of what we've seen the new, the new uh, pandemic behavior or somebody who's just coming new into a website, um, they're more likely to get uh, declined, actually five to seven times more likely to get declined uh, because they are uh, the, the merchants that are welcoming these customers might be using on rules or denial List or more blunt tool style of uh, fraud detection. And so it's not only about that moment of truth that we couldn't deliver to the customer, um, it's also the lifetime value loss. So 40% of these customers we know who are uh, falsely declined will never co come back and they're very likely going to go to the competition instead because their need is, their need is still unmet. Um, so I think there's opportunities not only in ensuring that things are personalized um, and that we're meeting customers where they want to be, but also ensuring that when we're doing that, uh, we're not turning uh, the, the door or closing the door on those good customers who are trying uh, businesses and experiences for the first time. I know that going back to the poll, customer experience was our, our, uh, our winner, not surprisingly. And so, Tori, I'm curious, thinking as we kind of move to our second topic of customer experience, how are you and, and Adobe thinking about this changing loyalty landscape and how to create loyalty in this increasingly digital world? Um, I love what Andrea said about meeting customers where they are. That is critically important to not only customer experience, but also driving loyalty. You know, it helps create that familiarity. It helps um, create a comfort, um, which drives that experience. And ultimately, you know, loyalty is all about how did you make me feel? Um, and that is 100% driven by the experience that people have with, with your brand or your business. Um, from, from an Adobe perspective, you know, that also means delivering the right content or the right offers um, at the right time and to the right audiences. And utilizing a, a unified profile um, and data, customer data really helps create that seamless capability, both online and offline, which is so critically important. Um, you definitely don't want to um, create a bad experience by having someone order something online um, and then, you know, they come back later and 
uh, they're prompted again for the same thing or worse, they go into the store and buy something um, and then they go online and you haven't recognized that they've made that in-store purchase. Um, all of those experiences matter when you're driving customer loyalty. And so really having that capability is really important. And this isn't just about the initial order. It's also about the reorder capability. Um, we often um, help our clients develop subscription capabilities um, and deliver that ease of reorder or one-click checkout. Um, all of those uh, sort of quick fixes um, from a customer perspective really help drive that loyalty and, and repeat buyer behavior. Yeah, Terry, I think you brought up some interesting points. I mean, obviously it's important to bring people back to the site, but one of the things that you said is that it has to be an experience that people um, are looking for and it's within the channel that is makes the most sense for them. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting um, a lot around customer experience is the ease of use around um, delivery and, you know, how quickly can I receive something? Like we, I think someone had mentioned earlier, you know, we want things instantly, right? So can I get same day delivery? Can I get next day delivery? And guess what? I'll pay more more for it too, because I want it when I want it, right? And I think a lot of that um, holds true when we're looking at customer retention as well too, and making sure that we're giving um, transparency around delivery expectations, stock status, all of those things are super important, right? Like if you take a look at Amazon, and I always bring this example up, for, on paper, Amazon's customer experience really isn't that great. Their product detail pages are super long. They have a ton of reviews, a ton of product content that you have to constantly scroll down to view. We're all used to it. And because of that, we, we know where to look on each page. We know to, where to scroll for reviews. But Amazon's really, you know, the real secret sauce is the fact that if you have a Prime membership or you're ordering on their site, you know when you're going to receive it. They're very flexible on that. They give you notifications telling you about, you know, where your order is and where the status is. And you have the option to pay more for it if you want. And that's really why Amazon can succeed is because they have a massive selection of products, but they also have invested a ton in things like order management and making sure that they are um, providing paths for customers to find what they need, get it when they want, but also make it easy for them to come back and reorder. So as we look at customer retention moving forward, yes, the front end of the experience of the site is important, but I would say if it's as important, as important, if not more important, that you're investing in back-end delivery systems to purchase things um, and have transparency into when they will actually receive them. As we look forward to 2022 and 2023, that's going to be a pivotal cornerstone point in customer retention as well. Justin and Tori, I think you bring up some really interesting points. Uh, I think, Tori, to your point of loyalty is how you make me feel. Um, I think the tool that a lot of businesses are using to be able to do that, to be able to do that not only at the first time of purchase, but also, as you mentioned, when you're reordering or where you're having subscriptions added is the concept of accounts. Accounts have become a very powerful tool for companies to create customer engagement and loyalty, particularly in our increasingly digital wor world, right? It's, it's the, a great touch point that you can have with your customer and make them feel special. Um, and because of that, we also see a, a, an increase in attacks uh, and, and trying to compromise this account. So in the last year, we've actually seen 55% increase in, a, in attempted account takeover attacks. Um, and we're expecting this to continue because with all the information, personal information that's floating in the dark web, we know fraudsters harvest the same data for future accounts, like those same passwords, those same emails can be used in one merchant, in another merchant, in order to try to compromise those accounts. And this makes particularly new users uh, to the internet more vulnerable. They tend to uh, have less of a tendency of maybe taking precautions and safeguarding their personal data. They might not necessarily be using, you know, uh, password management tools. They might be re reusing some of their passwords and their credentials. Um, so having, uh, being able to make the right fraud decisions at the right time, a lot of it is actually moving to the fore uh, at the, of the experience so that we can actually stop fraudsters from even trying to access customers' accounts and be able to protect that integrity. Um, I think, uh, Justin, to your point that you were mentioning about ensuring that we have real-time transparency to give um, that really, uh, you know, real-time uh, decision to your point in terms of inventory and whether we can deliver something on the same day. And sometimes even like within a couple of hours, because you're you know, buying something at lunch and you want to pick it up a couple of hours later when you're driving home. Uh, it really underlines the importance of automation, automation of your OEM system, making sure that it is actually moving forward and reflecting in your front end 
but also the automation of your fraud management tools. Um, if you are relying on a manual queue to give you an answer, and at the same time, you need to start fulfillment of something that is going to have to be delivered or available for a customer in three hours, you can't afford to have that lag. Um, so all systems need to be working together for automation so that you can actually deliver this loyalty and personalized experience that customers are expecting today. And so taking it back to really the original theme, you know, what are these big 2022 bets and our, our final topic of new trends and innovations, Tori, curious to hear from you, you know, what, what trends is Adobe capitalizing on when you guys are thinking about these memorable experiences and loyalty in this, this new digital era? Yeah, th this is going to sound awfully simple, but um, we really think that flexibility and extensibility coupled with a resilient platform and solution that's built on data is, is really necessary. Um, being able to make swift pivots, um, being able to meet customers where they are and execute on all the things that we've talked about is incredibly difficult unless you have the capability in the platform to actually execute to that. Um, if you're mired down by, um, you know, forcible use of features um, or forcible upgrades, you may not be able to actually react as quickly as you need to with changing market conditions. Um, and in some cases, you don't have the flexibility to expand to new markets. Um, we've seen a lot of our B2B businesses add a direct to consumer channel. Um, and in some cases, literally overnight, um, they have been able to make that pivot. Uh, that is operating well beyond the, the speed of business. And I think that is going to become increasingly critical. Uh, you know, we've also um, seen personalization at scale uh, as a huge bet um, going forward, and that really helps drive customer loyalty. It helps uh, improve both uh, bottom line and customer satisfaction. And so, you know, there's lots of ways to, to execute on those visions. Um, Justin, I, I know you advise a lot um, on, to our Adobe Commerce customers, specifically around headless implementations to drive experiences. How does that really support those as well as personalization? Sure. Well, headless is the future. That's for sure. There's no doubt. Um, you know, when you're looking at something like Adobe Commerce and pairing that with Adobe, you know, Target and Analytics and adding an Adobe Experience Manager in on top to run some of the front end and pieces of the glass, that's really where the future is going. Because to your point, Tori, like personalization is everything. And you know, the personalization we talk about now are things like maybe you open an email and you click on content. Whatever content you click on, maybe that it changes the experience on the front end of the site. But taking it even further and going forward. Forward and really leveraging some of the platforms we talked about, you know, based upon how you interact on the site, maybe that suggests different upsells and cross sells in your cart. Maybe it suggests different delivery and shipping options going forward too. So the idea of headless is using the best in class pieces of technology to deliver the best customer experiences. And at the end of the day, that's all we're really trying to do. What all of us are trying to do in the space is making sure that the customers and consumers that we have that are interacting with the experiences that we're creating are exceeding their expectations by a lot so that we can help them come back and obviously convert more, but also so that we can really just help them do whatever they're trying to do. If they're looking to go hiking this weekend and they need new hiking boots, let's inspire them to, to make that purchase, but fulfill what they're trying to do in their personal life. And that's really what keeps people coming back um, to the platforms and using the services going forward. So as we think about headless um, in the future, um, it's really taking a look at who your customers are, who your consumers are, and making sure that you're aligning the pieces of technology to the expectations that they have. And um, you know, headless is still something that is a big task to take on, right? It's a, it, it can um, be complex, but um, there's folks that that can help, like Proficient and Adobe and Ford are here too. Um, and it really, um, you know, when you're looking at other things too, and I'm curious to hear what Andrea's thoughts are around things like 
fraud solutions as well, um, you know, and how that can be scaled within a headless type of an environment. I think it's a good use case as to leveraging the best in class of something uh, or, or specific platform within um, a headless type of environment. So um, it's really something that that folks need to take a look at as they're looking to mature digital forward in their business. Um, and, it, and it's all about providing that best in class customer experience. Yeah. Justin, I think those are really great points. I'm, I, and I'm actually going hiking this weekend. So I think your good example really resonates Perfect. with me. Yeah. And hopefully some of the members of our audience as well. Um, I agree with you and Tori that the ability to pivot um, at a moment's notice so that you can actually take advantage of new experiences and be able to provide them to your customer is absolutely critical. Um, headless is definitely the way to do that. It's, it's really how businesses can actually do this, uh, kind of be ready for the moment, be ready for their 24 hour pivot. Um, just to share a statistic for us, we've seen that BOPIS or, you know, buy online, pick up in store, click and connect grew by 200% last year. So we know that once businesses implement those fast changes, customers will follow, they will appreciate it. And that would make a big difference between somebody who actually has those, those um, experiences versus another uh, business that might not. Um, what this also means is that the rapid growth of the channels coupled with the ability to deploy things very fast for the consumers is that businesses really need to have a 360 degree view of the personas they interact with. Um, the fact that we now have all these different data points means that businesses really need to fight fraud and abuse. So it's not only about somebody doing criminal activity, but maybe uh, customers who are seeking to take advantage of those uh, flexible, good customer policies. Um, and they need to do this across more touch points and an unprecedented scale because the adoption is unprecedented as well. Um, and the, the, on the flip side of that is that fraudsters know this and they will purposely go and target new experiences precisely because they know that they have a certain level of immaturity and that typically will present new areas of expo exploitation for them. Um, and so what we have at, at Forder in the way that we're thinking about it is that, you know, it's not only about like trying to stop fraud as a isolated event at one point of your experience or another point of your experience is to really have a 360 degree view of the actual digital persona, right? Um, and that allows to really support omnichannel strategy so that you're not producing maybe a situation where you say yes on a customer in one of your touch points, but then you actually deny that same customer in a different touch point because your view of those personas are actually not working together. Um, so I think from, from that perspective, really being able to recognize your customer across your entire experience is putting those trust decision points in the right places of the experience and making sure that the answers that you're getting and the decisions you're making are consistent will actually drive and deliver uh, the outcome of the type of new innovation that businesses are really you know, we're trying to, to seek and offer their customers and just making sure that they're not getting denied at the end of a very arduous process where you're trying to put something new together for your customers. Yeah. I'm looking at the clock here as we, as we wrap up, you three have shared a lot of great advice and recommendations. And I'd be curious to hear really from each of you as our, our merchants on the line are thinking about starting this journey and preparing for the new users, new trends, new expectations, what advice would each of you have? I'll, Justin, I'll let you uh, kick us off. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the advice I always give in this, this question, because it does come up a lot, is it depends, right? We could sit here and talk about headless and all these different things all day, but it really depends upon what the needs of your customers are. So you have to start with the data, the analytics, the KPIs that you have today on who your customers are, right? So if you look at it today, how is it different than what it might have been two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago? Because your customers and who they are and what's important to them changes over time. We talked about at the top of this, this call around COVID. COVID and how it changed customer expectations. It likely even created new customers that are using the experiences that you've built. And because of that, you know, that that's inherent, right? That's going to organically happen all the time. So you constantly have to be looking at what's important to your customers, seeing how they're interacting with new things that you might be building on your site and your e-commerce platform, trying to understand through voice of the customer surveys, you know, what are some of the pain points for them? Um, trying to understand what are some of the pain points for your employees too. When you're, when they're speaking, like your CSR reps, when they have calls that come in, what are people complaining about? And it's really then laying the foundation off of that for the experiences that make the most sense for your customers, but also for your employees. So 
my big piece of advice would be continue to look at the data and analytics that you have on your customers. Um, identify the pain points that are currently there today. If you can, try to forecast what's coming down the road, but start with those elements first, and that will lead you to what sort of pieces of technology or experiences that you need to create to really create a high customer lifetime value and increase that retention bit rate to, to keep them coming back. And it sounds simplistic, right? Like give your customers what they want, but when you introduce things like omni-channel and, and all these other uh, types of avenues that you can interact with customers, it can be a bit complex, but uh, lo looking at the data to start with will give you the elements you needed to determine what course you have to take moving forward. Yeah, I, I love that, Justin. I think to build on that, you know, to your point, once you understand what you're trying to solve for, uh, you know, do you have the right technology? And is that technology prepared um, not only for that near-term strategy and execution that you've just defined, but also for changes that you may not be able to predict um, that are you know, coming in the future? I think you know, brands really have to be able to react to behavioral changes and the marketplace demands. Um, and I think making sure that you are you know, able to do that, um, you know, not just from a people and process perspective, but also from a technology perspective is going to be really critical. I mean, you really cannot afford any longer to wait, um, you know, more than 24 to 48 hours to make some of these pivots. Um, you know, if COVID has taught us nothing, um, it has definitely taught us that that resilience um, and that ability to make a shift quickly um, could mean the difference in your business making it through um, the next, uh, you know, pandemic or the next um, broad global event um, or not. And so I think that is going to be very critical for, for businesses to look into. Sorry, I think that's a really great observation. Um, it's not only to your point about what's you know un unforeseen, um, but maybe even some things that we already know are coming, but will impact that ability to deliver a good customer experience. Um, from our from our side, I think to to build up on what you both have said, it is really about having the technology and the right technology partners that allow you to make better personalized and connected decisions along the entire customer journey. Um, you know, I think one of the things like that, that comes to mind when you mentioned, right, things that are coming down the line, I am actually thinking about our friends in Europe and the implementation of PSD2. Um, and the fact that you can have an incredible uh, customer experience and you're able to pivot it in 24 hours, but if you're presenting a, a strong customer authentication challenge to 30% of your customers, it will have a great impact on your conversion and your ability to give them a good experience. Um, so can you actually have the right trust signals to know who you can actually say yes to uh, because you've already seen them before and in, in a way that is not only about who you've already seen, but a broad network of places where, uh, for example, in our case, we can see good customers that have already interacted in other merchant sites and we're able to extend that great uh, experience into a brand new site that they go to because we know they can be trusted. So um, in other words, in today's omnichannel environment where there's so much more surface area for fraud and abuse, uh, we want to make sure that merchants can actually welcome new and protect their existing customers and doing so with less friction by having really precise real-time fraud decisions. And, and with that, I think that's all the time we have. If, if there are a, a question or two on the line, we're happy to stick around for a few minutes and, and make sure we get those answered. And if not, I just want to take a quick minute to say thank you for everyone who joined for the merchants on the line and for our amazing speakers. We will absolutely be uh, sharing a recording of the session and you'll see our, our contact information on the slide here and we look forward to, to continuing the conversation. So thank you again, everyone.